We are now convened and now we are now reconvened in open session. Um, we are going to move action items for the sake of time and I know that's what you are here to hear. Um, we are going to move those in front of consent agenda. Okay. First, we are going to consider action on closed items. Mrs. Tossan. Thank you, Mr. Burdeen. I move that the Board of Trustees assign the Level 3 Employee Grievance Appeal of Dr. Brandy Buford to Richard Hightower, who will serve as the Board's designated hearing officer under Board Policy DGBA Local. Second. There was a motion by Mrs. Tossan and a second by Mr. Rice. Please vote. Do or do we, I'm sorry, do we have any discussion? Hearing none. Hearing none, please vote. The, the motion passes unanimously. Mrs. James. Thank you, Mr. Verdeen. I move to appoint Felicia James to the position of high school principal. Second. The motion was made by Mrs. James, second by Mr. Rice. Do we have any discussion? Hearing none, please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Next. Uh, Mrs. Haliger. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. President. I move to appoint Dr. Iwaga Sanders to the position of high school principal. Second. Motion was made by Mrs. Hilliger, second by Mr. Rice. Do we have any discussion? Hearing none, please vote. Motion passes unanimously. All right, on to board member report, Mr. Rosenthal. Yes, sir. So, as usual, <clears throat> we have been busy. Uh, most of us attended the SLI, uh, TASB SLI in San Antonio. Uh, several of us made presentations at SLI, uh, attended community meetings at Ridgepoint and Hightower High School, attended high school graduations. Texas School Safety Center Conference, City of Sugarland Count City Council Meeting, Mentoring at Ridgemont Elementary, Policy Committee Meetings, Board Team Building, Vision and Planning Meeting, SHAC Meeting, Retirement Event for Jerry Cameraman, and GCAASB Board Meeting and LAC Meeting. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Next is special reports. Do we have any special reports this evening? None. All right. Next, we are going to move the action items 12A1. Dr. Dupree. Well, A1. May I have a motion for 12A1? Mr. President, I move to approve action item 12A1 as presented. Second. Motion made by Mr. Rice, second by Mrs. Tossan. Do we have discussion? Hearing none, please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Next, 12B1. Consider approval of the 2018-19 general fund do I have a motion? Mr. President, I move to approve action item 12B1 as presented. Motion made by Mr. Rice, second by um, Mr. Mr. George. Do we have discussion? Yes. Mrs. Heliger? Yes, I have a quick question, just for clarity. I might get a little confused, but 
So considering approval of the 2018-9 general fund debt service fund and child nutri nutrition fund, does that include the funds for maintenance for those items that we talked about earlier in um, this meeting around security and anything like that would come out of the potential bond? It, it does not include those items. Okay. Whenever we're, this was put together at the time, this is you know well before the last you know incident in Santa Fe, mm -hmm. and so if we if we do need to make any additions to, you know to the budget, it'll come whenever we do our uh, uh, an amendment in the future, mm -hmm. which we always bring an amendment in the September time frame. Okay, thank you for your clarification. Thank you, Mrs. Elliger, Mrs. James. Yeah, I just had a quick question, Mr. Bassett. Does this? Um budget um, require a tax increase at number one question and number two how much of our um, savings uh, does this budget uh, require uh, this budget does not um, need a tax rate increase and right now th this budget uh, would have 5.6 million of our anticipated um, um, what are we calling it? The economic, uh, economic stabilization fund. Excuse me. Um, we are uh, um, asking the board in the next subsequent item to uh, reserve nine million dollars uh, for that, and so this would this uh, budget would take up five point six million of that if we did have a deficit of that that magnitude. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bassett. Can I have a motion? You have. I'm, I'm sorry. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Next, 12B3, consider approval of budget amendments. 12B2, consider approval of committed fund balance resolution. Thank you. Can I have a motion? Mr. President, I move that we present item 12B2 as presented. Motion made by Mrs. Tossan, second by Mr. George. Do we have discussion? Mrs. James. Mr. Bassett, could you just, um, it's not up on the screen, but there's a chart that you included on the item uh, that lists the amounts. Uh, could you could you go over that for us? Yes, ma'am. It's so on page 118 of our board book. Yes, ma'am. So uh, we would uh, continue with uh, holding 6.4 million as a committed amount for major maintenance and repair. Uh, we have an amount to be determined for the campus activity funds. The campus activity funds are funds that um, technically belong to the district, but because they're raised by the uh, the campuses, um, you know, we we anticipate they would continue to spend them as they have in the past. But uh, but we do need to have them as a committed amount. And we'll know that final amount after the after the year is over. Um, the uh, loss of state revenue, uh, that amount would uh, equate to one month of our expenditures, and so that amount would increase to 52.8 million. Uh, we have an amount in there for new schools to help us in the future with new school openings of 4.5 million, and the economic stabilization amount that I mentioned earlier of 9 million. These are all committed funds and are not part of the. Um, unassigned fund balance that we look to to make up that additional two months of our uh, of our fund balance to adhere to board policy okay thank you so the amount uh, from the camp of the campus activity funds that's to be determined so you guys will be determining that after the end of the year yes and is that something where this is money that kids have raised and it's going to be taken away from them now or how did, what is that no ma'am so um these funds technically do belong to the district uh and we're required to to account for them in this way but in no way are we counting on their funds to balance our budgets or whatever else this is we're treating them the same way we, we do every year and you'll see that final amount whenever we do present the, the CAFR to you thank you very much thank you mr bassett please vote Motion passes unanimously. Next, 12B3, consider approval of budget amendments. Can I have a motion? 
Mr. President, I move to approve item 12B3 as presented. Motion made by Mrs. Tossan and a second by Mr. George. Do we have discussion? Hearing none, please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Next, 12B4A. Consider approval of facilities master plan recommendations related to the utilization of LM3 schools and Marshall and Willow Ridge High School feeder patterns. Can I have a motion? President. Mr. President, I move to approve action item 12B4A as presented. Motion made by Mr. Rice. Second by, by second made by Mr. George. Do we have discussion? Yes. Mr. Rosenthal. So I thought a lot about this one over the past week. <clears throat> um, and it, it kind of dawned on me, especially after seeing Mr. Bassett's uh, budget development presentation last week. Um, and then the uh, ensuing discussion about marginal revenues from bringing additional students back into the district. Uh, you've provided us information this week on uh, some of the, uh, somewhat of the, well, I guess we heard the number last week from PASA. Um, I'm not sure. We, we got a little, somewhat of a breakdown, I think, based on high schools. Uh, I think that's all I saw in the uh, response to some of our questions. Um, so I don't think it broke it down by elementary schools. But, um, the issue is I went back and actually looked at the amount of money we're pouring into some of these schools that are 50 years old. Um, and I think that we really need to take a look at this from uh, bringing in this additional uh, marginal revenue, as Mr. Bassett calls it. Um, and I, I think don't think we looked at that um, through this lens during this whole process. I really don't. I don't think the, the steering committee, well, one, we didn't know what kind of deficits we were facing uh, in the year 1920 and then 20 and 21. And um, I don't think that information was out there as far as how much uh, money that we recapture for every student that comes back into the district. Uh, for example, I think PASA said that we have 8,000 students living in the district that go elsewhere. Now, Obviously, we're not going to get 8,000 people back, but if you were, that's what, about 45 plus million dollars? Yes, sir, that's, that's pretty close. That's 45 million dollars, folks. Our budget deficit just went away. Now, we're not going to get that back. We're not going to get it all back. There's no way that, you know, 8,000 people, because people do go for uh, reasons that they want to go to, a, they want a religious education, and we can't provide that. So, um, but there are probably a lot of people that we can. And as we talked about ear earlier with the educational adequacy, when, when we're designing all these new schools, I mean, it's, it's top of the line. It's, you know, 21st century. They get everything in those schools. And I really don't think that we can put some of those things or most of those things into some of these old buildings. And I think when you look at it from that point of view, um, I wonder whether we shouldn't have gone back and really discussed this in more detail as far as some of the other options. And I know there's always kind of trepidation about talking about closing schools, but if you could build a brand new, like Ann Sullivan type or one of the new prototypes that we have that could then merge two of these schools and you have something brand new that people want to come back to. And, you know, if you inc also include the programming, because quite honestly, if you combine these things right, yeah, you're talking about a little bit more money, but it's, you know, you're making that money back every single year if you bring back a couple hundred kids into that zone. So that kind of pays for itself over time, and you end up converting debt into M&O. Um, so I really think that we should really kind of step back from this one and take a look at this again. Um, I'm not prepared to, to vote for this, and I guess, you know, in, in, until we really do that. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Mrs. James? Mrs. Helliger? I don't know if we have the same thing to say, but uh, this whole facilities planning has been an extreme challenge. 
Um, what do we do? What, what we do? What we not do? You know, this team is mad. This team is good, happy with you if you say the right things. And this is, we are trustees and we have to do what's best for all of our kids in our district. And so part of what, you know, I've been pondering with a couple of these recommendations is what is our true philosophy as a board when it comes to approaching um, how we solve this issue around the underutilization, the overutilization, the right programming. We've got ourselves in a little mix right now with because we don't really have things that were totally defined for us to say, yes, this is going here. Yes, that's going there. And so it, it puts me at a at a, at a predicament with how to move forward with these things. I mean, to make a decision like closing down two schools and, and combining that, that would have been something that we needed to have talked about months ago and get the community buy-in. Um, so, and what does that look like? And, and have the administration tell us what that looks like, you know? Because it's more than just the two schools. It's what are they going to get, you know, if you do it, if you do combine that, you know? Um, and so I'm a bit challenged with that and some of the other ones that we have because some communities, I think one of the speakers said, we rezone for that one or we build new schools for that one and then we rezone for some. And so I challenge this board to really think about what is our true philosophy when approaching these hard and difficult questions tonight. How we, I mean, because we're, we're not consistent. I don't think we're consistent. I'm not seeing the evidence. And I understand that each community has their own different challenges that we need to take a look at. But I'm not seeing a true overall arching philosophy on how we're approaching this. Um, that's coming out with some of the decisions that we're that we're uh, making. Um, you know, one of the things I heard loudly was no more band-aids, no more band-aids. So a situation like that, which could possibly be a good idea, but guess what? We haven't even explored that. We have no community buy-in. None. So if your question is, do we, because right now we don't have defined programs for this recommendation, right? And, and if, if I hear you correctly, you're saying, let's not vote on this at all tonight. Because right now the, the motion is to vote on this recommend, recommendation, right? And so we would have to either vote it down or rescind our um, we send the um, motion itself, right? I just want to make sure that we're clear. Okay. I'll report back to Ms. James. I might come back. Mrs. James. Thank you, Mr. Verdeen. And thank you, Ms. Helliger, for expressing that because I think that is that, um, what Mr. Rosenthal said is a bold move and what you said is, um, is a really good point. So you started off by saying this process has been very difficult and I would agree with that and I've particularly struggled with it because I'm very linear and I like to kind of go in order and have some sort of order to process and order to um, the information and I've really struggled over the last um, several, well, over the last two months, but particularly over the last four weeks, as after we voted on these things the first time, I was like, okay, what did we vote on? What are we trying to do here? And what exactly what you said, what's our philosophy? What are we trying to do? So as I was thinking about that this weekend, I kind of came up with two things. I think the first thing we're trying to do is we are trying to plan for our growth, the growth, uh, our student growth in our district. Uh, and the second thing we're trying to do, which came out of the conversation last week, um, was that we need to um, attract students um, to our district. Part of it is we need to upgrade their experience and improve student outcomes. But then part of it is we really, 
um, need to attract new students that aren't currently, currently attending our district. And so what it boils down to me, there's two pieces of this. Um, it's planning for growth and then it's attracting new students and really around that attracting new students comes the concept of what's the business plan and Mr. Rosenthal that's what you're saying what's the business plan for this and what makes it work what makes it pay out I asked the question last week how many students do we need to attract in the Marshall feeder pattern say to make this work, to make this a viable thing, to get our enrollment to 80% and what kind of an impact um, would that have on our M&O, which is, and you know, which would be the follow-up question now that I've kind of got my mind around this. So I, I wanted to say that because to me that's the driving philosophy around this and we never really grasp, unfortunately we never really or at least I didn't grasp that at the beginning of the process. And so I think that's why we've had this swirl and back and forth because we haven't really understood what our priorities are and what our, what our plan is. And some of, as some of the audience pointed out tonight, we were missing a few facts and some details weren't quite right. And so that plays into it also. But, but the board had trouble getting to the, to those missing facts because we were caught up in, in the swirl of what is it that we were trying to do. So I proposed some different language to the recommendations tonight and it's at your place and the ones we're talking about right now are recommendations six and eight. The changes that I made would require an amendment but I'm just going to read it uh, at the moment. So it starts off the same. Use available elementary capacity in the Marshall High School feeder pattern to implement innovative instructional programs, programming that. And I moved to our first priority, improve student outcomes, because I believe that this board is all about improving student outcomes and that is the number one thing we need to do in both the Marshall and Willow Ridge Peter pattern, that is the highest priority of this board. And we've already take, taken action and talked about the Early Literacy Center, um, which directly impacts that, that we're going to pilot. Expanding choice opportunities I listed second, and I added an increases utilization and marginal revenue because that's the part that we had talked about last week, and that's the part Mr. Rosenthal actually just brought up. The reason that I like this um, wording is because it brings um, some measurability into the recommendation and looking at what the outcomes might be. Um, and so um, in the narrative around this recommendation six and recommendation eight, they talk about the the number of 80% is talked about. Um, and so uh, I think that's a good that's a good starting point, but I think there's a business case and a business plan to be to be looked at. And I, I would challenge the administration to try to figure out, you know, really what that is, what that is. So with everyone's permission, I would like to propose an amendment to the last um, sentence of both recommendation six and recommendation eight beginning with the word that instead of what's currently written in the item i'd like to, to read that improves student outcomes expands choice opportunities and increases utilization and marginal revenue <coughs> So, hmm? so if you'll call on me, I'll come in. What? Do we have a second? Well, we have to have a motion to amend. So did you make the motion to amend? Mm -hmm. I'll second it. Mm -hmm. Motion by Mrs. James and second by Mrs. Tossin. Do we have discussion? Yes. Mrs. Tossin. Okay, so 
Thank you, Mrs. James. So I like this addition. Um, I, I have equally spent a, a lot of time this past week thinking about these recommendations. Um, and for me, I, I think, I don't know that I struggled with what we're doing because in my mind, we were always dealing with growth and utilization uh, and, then, and then facilities that, are, that need updating. So I, I think that was pretty well defined for me from the beginning. I think what got muddled along the way um, for me and maybe for a lot of others is how we were going to address those issues. So not what are we doing, but how are we going to address it? Because uh, Ms. Mrs. Marino stood up here very early on and made uh, some comments about um, the fact that we were supposed to be looking at programming to address a lot of these issues. And that was always my expectation that, that would we have to look at rezoning? Yes. Would we have to look at new buildings? Yes. Would we have to look at updating buildings? Yes. But we were also supposed to look at programming, not just because it would help the utilization, but also because it would provide choice. It was a way for us to attract those students uh, who maybe left the district, maybe attract students who have never been in the district, and also to, um, to offer choice because that's what families want. So I feel like along the process, we got a little derailed in that and it became mostly about zoning and, and building and we maybe forgot about the programming along the way. So in my opinion, I think that we are rebuilding two schools because the FCI was so high that it's not safe for children. And so we have to rebuild, we have to either rebuild those schools or we have to shut them down, demolish them, and combine those and combine those student bodies. And this board made the decision to rebuild those schools um, for lots of different reasons that, you know, each of it may be different for each of us. Not every school needs to be rebuilt. Not every school's FCI is high. Some of them need repairs, some of them need additions. And I actually um, probably disagree with Mr. Rosenthal in this. I think there's a lot of things we can do to bring up educational adequacy. And I'm speaking as a mother of a child with a disability, and I could probably list a dozen right now that we could easily do in some of our older schools that would improve education for our kids. Are we gonna get all the nice, you know, some of the nicer construction and that kind of thing? No, maybe not, but furniture can make a huge difference. Providing educational pullout space could make a huge difference. There's lots of things that we can do and provide in schools, I think, that would raise that educational adequacy. Um, so I, I like the motion as amended. I think we have to offer that programming. And I think the issue with these schools is that they're underutilized. We are gonna have bond money to, um, to do all the, the facilities, deficiency and life cycle things that we need to do. Um, I don't know that that's the right, that I would ever gotten to the point where I think these schools need to be closed or um, something new built or anything along those lines. But like Ms. Helliger said, we kind of haven't been through that process, but I'm not sure I would ever get there anyway. I think to address utilization, we've got to either think, we've got to think zoning or programming. And in schools, if we want to keep the, the cohort together or the students together, and we also want to attract those students from outside the district, and we also want to offer choice, and we also want to improve student outcomes, which is our number one thing, then, then I believe these programs, this innovative programming needs to be look, looked at. And, and I also want to point out um, that we did add the micro society model that you talked about, which I really like because it gives us truly that completely different model of something that no one else is offering. If, if we really want to attract kids and really want to give them an opportunity to be smart in a different way, as we've talked about, then this is the opportunity for us to do it. That's all I have to say. 
Mr. Rosenthal. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you for, for um, giving a shout out to the Micro Society because I, I think that's it aligns perfectly with our profile of a graduate. It also brings in student ownership of learning. So um, my, my, I guess my, my point is if we, if we think that, that using this money that we propose, that we put in, you know, for this temporary bond, for this thing, for, for, for this cycle, for these particular schools, if we think that we can, we can make these look really nice and renovate them in a nice way, Oscar, and, you know, in order to attract more people back into the district, because we just, we have to do that, you know, zoning from one part of the district to another, you just, you know, you're just moving people around. You're not bringing people in. And in, in two years or actually a year from now, we're looking at a 20 point some million dollar deficit. And I know I'm focusing on dollars, but, you know, I don't want us to have to have to go through a decision of either another massive M&O tax rate or something that Jim had to go through years ago and riffing people because riffs aren't good for kids either. So, you know, the whole thing here is what's best for kids. Okay. And this is where, again, you, you said it, we've never really, we've always talked about different things, you know, neighborhood schools. Well, if neighborhood schools were like the be all end all, we'd never have a failing neighborhood school, but that's not necessarily the case. So, um, we need to figure out, and you and I talked about this on the phone, Dr. Dupree, today. We need to figure out why people are leaving and what will bring them back. And I feel like that should have happened a year or so ago before we got into all this. I, I just, I feel like, Addie, I mean, this just went too fast. And again, I mean, today we just got new information. And, um, you know, it's not one, it's not fair to us because we're having to deal with all this stuff. And, um, and, and it's not, it's not in the best interest of making the best decisions. And so, um, I'll have a little more to say on that, you know, later, but again, we need to do what we need to do to, uh, again, obviously when you have kids attracted to your school, okay, you're going to be able to have more resources to put into those classrooms and that's going to be better for kids. Um, Programming. If we can attract more kids in, same thing. You got more revenue. You got more support for the kids, um, and that's going to be best for kids. The location of the school isn't necessarily, you know, the optimal solution. I don't think that's that's a priority. And I think sometimes we have made it a priority. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Um, I would like to call for a vote on the First Amendment. Do we need to restate that amendment? You know, you gotta... Okay. Please vote. Vote passes unanimously. May I have a motion for the original amendment? Say that again. May I have a vote on the amended motion? Vote passes unanimously. Next item, 12B4B. Consider approval of facilities master plan recommendations related to the utilization of Marshall and Willow Ridge High Schools. Mr. President. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that reads as follows. To use available high school capacity in the Marshall and Willow Ridge high school feeder patterns to implement innovative instructional programming that improves student outcomes, expands choice opportunities, and increases utilization and marginal revenue. Okay. Motion by Mrs. James, second by Mrs. Helliger. Do we have discussion? Mrs. Helliger. I, I think my comments, I just wanted to make sure that, um, <clears throat> you know, we talked about programs here at the high school level, but I definitely think the programs that feed it from our elementary school and middle school 
it will make the high school program successful. And I think we have to make sure that when we're, we're putting these together, what are the, what is the structure to support those programs in the high school long term? Because I just don't think just putting new programs in it um, will be successful off the bat. You know, I think we talked last time about what is that period of time that we want to see the utilization. And I think you said to 2023. 20, I think it's an 85% utilization. Yes. I think you said 2023. Um, so that that's five years out. So that means that we've got to put programs in place in the earlier schools, in middle school, elementary, like now, to make sure that we keep those students into the high schools um, and are wanting to go to the wonderful programs that we say we're going to do in high school. Okay, so I just want to make sure that we keep that in mind in a couple of years when when we're discussing and reviewing um, student outcomes. Thank you, Mrs. Helliger. Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to ask Mr. Morris for clarification because I believe Mrs. James has made an original motion and therefore we do not have an amended motion. Is that correct? That is correct. So the first motion made was the original motion made by Ms. James. It deviates from the recommendation, but it is the original motion. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify because my first board meeting as board president in 2012, I, I was accused of conducting an illegal vote. You might remember that, Mrs. James. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. I appreciate your support. Mrs. James. I do remember that, Mr. Rice, so thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. Parliamentary procedure can be uh, challenging, and when uh, we are sitting up here in the dais with cameras and things looking at us, it gets even more challenging. Uh, so uh, thank you. I want to just comment, and this is a question for administration. I, I sent this earlier, but I don't know that I got an answer. Um, in none of these uh, motion or recommendations or even a conversation did we bring up middle schools. Um, and this is focused on the high schools and the other one was focused on the elementary schools. Was there any conversation by the um, steering committee about, about middle schools and innovative programming at the middle schools? We did have a discussion, uh, the steering committee did, about programming at the middle school, not in these two particular feeder patterns, um, but Stephanie Williams is here if she wants to provide any additional detail regarding middle school programming in this area. Stephanie, do you have anything to add? The only thing that I would add is that as we identify programming in the elementary and in the high school, as you said, Ms. Hellinger, we would be looking at what are the supports that are needed in the middle school in order to um, have a fully aligned K-12 program. So there could be an impact in the middle school, but that couldn't be determined until we identify the programming that we would put in place and making sure that we don't have a gap there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. So I guess I just offer a comment, uh, maybe two comments. One is I'm... As some folks in the audience expressed tonight, I'm concerned about uh, brand new programs being developed and trying to pilot in um, one of these high schools um, where, uh, I don't know, I'm just concerned that about the success rate that we might have with that. So um, I think that that's something that needs to be really thought out before we try something brand new. Um, so that would be my thought. We might want to consider something that we already know how to do or that we're already doing well. Uh, and then the second thing is, and this is a comment maybe a little bit more for Mr. Perez as he's working together on putting together construction packages. If our goal is to um, draw students in to these feeder patterns, then we might need to think about it might become true that enhancements to these schools actually become priorities. So things that we wouldn't necessarily, um, wouldn't be at the top of the bucket list everywhere might be important in these feeder patterns if we're trying to attract students 
for one reason or another, or we're considering some type of programming uh, that might require modifications or might be enhanced um, by modifications or additions. An example comes to mind. We recently, this board recently, in the last year at least, voted to add a uh, update the welding uh, lab at Ridge Point High School. I don't know the state of the welding lab at Marshall High School or Willow Ridge High School, but that might be an example of a thing that um, that might be an enhancement uh, that we might want to include. And you guys, I'm sure, can brainstorm on some other ideas. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. James. Mrs. Tolsan? Thank you, Mr. Burdine. So I want to start by agreeing with Mrs. James, and this brings my mind back to what we discussed in the, in the board workshop about considering CTE programming, which is really very different from a lot of this, some of these innovative things we're talking about, because we know that we have kids who are in these CTE programs. We know we have kids who are interested in CTE programs, and we've talked about having, uh, I mean, as we open our CTE center, having uh, additional programming on the other side of the district to make sure that we're um, offering, uh, offering those programs to all of our kids. So I just want to say that again. Um, because I think it goes hand in hand with what Mrs. James is saying about potentially, and, and Mr. Rosenthal, about potentially providing those enhancements and those updates and making sure our schools are, are prepared and ready to receive um, those additional students. I want to just reiterate, um, Stephanie Brown came and spoke earlier. I want to make sure that if we have kids who are supposed to be attending Marshall High School and who are not attending Marshall High School and not in other programs, such as academy programs and that type of thing outside of Marshall High School, I think that that needs to be addressed. Um, and I worry like she does that we need to make sure that we have appropriate staffing. We, we talked in here about um, about increasing the endorsements that are offered at Marshall and also at Willow Ridge. And I know that we've done that. So I want to make sure that we're supporting that. Um, I mean, we can say we're doing it, but if we're not actually doing it, then we're not helping kids. So I want to make sure that we're, we're staffing appropriately and that we're offering classes just like are being offered in other schools because kids are not going to come if we're not offering those classes. Now, when it comes to long-term subs and that kind of thing, I know Ridge Point parents are in here and we have similar issues. Uh, we have similar issues at other schools. Um, so it's not just Marshall that has those problems. Other high, We have other problems, staffing problems like that at other high schools. But I just wanted to bring that back to the forefront and make sure that we keep that at the front of our minds as we're um, thinking about programming and and thinking about uh, uh, what class you know what kids we're going to attract by making sure we offer those classes. Because um, we say innovative, so the three things listed are early college, high school, innovative pathway coursework, and academy program. The early college thing I think could be a really great thing if we handle it right. But innovative pathway coursework is if it's not supported, it does nothing does nothing for us. So I just wanted to make those comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Tossin. Mr. Rosenthal. Yes, sir. So we did see in the um, response uh, that was sent out, I looked at it today, it, where it was clear how many students were leaving each one of our high schools and attending specific private or charter schools. So again, um, and then we also heard, like you just brought up, that we have students who are zoned to Marshall that are leaving Marshall. So, again, it comes back to we need to find out why and what needs to, to – what why they left specifically. And I think from that we start to learn, okay, here's what we need to do about that. And I just – I think that's crucial. Um, again, it, it's going to involve a marketing effort, and, you know, I kind of wish we had done that. But um, – and I'm gonna I'm gonna say what you know 
piggyback off and re basically repeat what you said about we need to verify what courses you know are available there because I remember several years ago uh, when we started rolling out all that stuff there was there was a, a spreadsheet at each campus it has this 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 so if it doesn't have that anymore um, why are there not enough student is there not enough student interest do we not have the teachers to teach it uh, we, we, there's a lot of information we need to know uh, early college high school it sounds great I would like to personally see um, some success rates uh, these these things are they're out there uh, we ought to have some information on how many people have attended how many associate degrees they've given out have those people gone on uh, whatever we can find out about them to make sure that it's something we want to do because I don't want to just yeah let's just put this program in but if we know that, you know, it's got a success rate of 20%, you know, in the region, you know, maybe not. So I, I don't know, because you're going to come to me at some point and say, we want to put it in this early college high school. And just like, you know, we've been missing information all along here. What do I have to go on? I have nothing. Okay. And I don't want to be in that situation because we need to make smart decisions. Um, and as you somebody brought up in was it enhancements mm -hmm. so yeah you can you know maybe we can again think outside the box first find out why people are leaving and then find out you know what would have kept them there i mean do we need to you know do some like advanced astronomy type things dr Dupree, you and i talked about you know putting an observatory at, at some of our schools and you could probably get grants for a lot of that equipment putting advanced robotics lab advanced chemistry mm -hmm. labs or something just to make it cool you know Say, hey, this is good. I want to. I want to be here. That's what we need to do. And as far as middle school um, programs in Kingsville, they have extended micro society into their middle schools. So it's a nice, you know, um, what do we call it? I can't think. Transition or alignment is what the word I'm looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal, Mrs. Helliger. There's a saying, um, put your money where your mouth is. And um, so I feel like since we, I've been here for the last three years, we've talked about doing all these great things at Marshall High School and Willow Ridge. Cause I think there are two different types of school with two different types of needs. And I know we keep putting them together, but they are different schools. And so um, for me, it's really about the commitment to it, I think we we start off and we say good things, but then we don't course correct either quick enough. I think it really will start with leadership, and I think we made some decisions here around that to to get us on the right track. But you know, as long as I'm on the board, and I know you guys feel the same way, we have got to be committed to making. And providing the right direction to our administ administration around ensuring that once we get those questions answered that they talked about, that we are actually committed to seeing it through and not just pacifying, you know, every year when well, we didn't get this or we didn't get this. We've got to make the commitment. So at this time, I guess I was going to call for a vote, but you got one last comment. Yeah. Mrs. Jim Thank you, Mrs. Hellier. Mrs. James. Thank you. I appreciate your comments, Ms. Hellier. And uh, since uh, Mr. Rosenthal brought up the early college high school, uh, you know, we've talked about it just a little bit or kind of vaguely, but I think the questions you ask are really good, Mr. Rosenthal. And first of all, where's the right place for it? Or if it's going to be at two schools or three schools, is that right? And is that a good use of our resources? And then uh, do the students want that? Is that what's, is that, is that of interest to them? Does that want that? We might want that for them, but is that what they want? And how do we get some buy-in on that? And how do we have that conversation? Um, and then I, I like your question too about what are the outcomes and what does it look like in our region? Um, what's the profile? What type of students attend an early college high school and are successful there and, and have a, a long have long term success. So to me that's important information. So thank you for asking that. Thank you, Mrs. James. Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. President. Well I would like also like to agree with uh, Mrs. Hayliger. 
I think that we need, uh, I would ask you, Dr. Dupree, if we approve this tonight, when can we expect uh, additional information on, on this, these programs? And so we would, uh, assuming we would have additional information about what they would look like, then we need a follow-up to see how they're actually being implemented and how uh, the, the efficacy of those programs. So we, we would need something as soon as the program can be developed and then at least, uh, you know, probably halfway through the following year after it's been started and at the end of the first year, and we'll, we'll, we're going to have to monitor it for a few years to see how it's working. I agree with Mrs. Helliger. We need to make a commitment to it and we need to stick with it and follow through. Uh, and then if we do, uh, I'm sure it will yield good results with all of the attendant benefits Mr. Rosenthal has outlined previously. Thank you. Call for a vote. Thank you, Mr. Rice. I, I agree that we need to be committed and we need to make sure that we'll have a good return on our investment um, as we do our research. So please vote. Motion passes. Um, please vote on the motion as amended. No, that was the motion. Okay. Next, we have 12B4C. Consider approval of facilities master plan recommendation related to the utilization of Ridge Point High School. Mr. President, I move to approve action item 12. 12. What is it? 12B4C. 12B4C as presented. Second. Motion by Mr. Rice. A second by Mrs. Tossan. Do we have discussion? Yes. Could somebody please read how it's presented? Consider. Well, go ahead. what we have done, as you recall, the board took action on the 14th to of May 14th to include uh, to develop a proof of concept to rebalance enrollment between Ridgepoint and Hightower, and to include budget for a purchase of a high school site in the 18 bond program. This action tonight is simply to um, addend, well, append to that an addendum to recommendation nine that says include funding for a high school for approximately 2,700 students in the next bond program. So would add this item to the list of three items the board previously approved. Okay, but the, the previous one still includes the proof of concept for flexible scheduling, right? Yes, which has which, been completed. It's just... Okay. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Mr. George. Thank you, Mr. Berdeen. Um, a couple of questions I have in this uh, item is, one is, can someone explain what is projected impact means, you know, like I, I'm not understanding it. Right? Okay. Okay. If that's the case, that's fine. It's already been completed. Another question I have is, of course, we are talking about rebalancing, um, you know, uh, Rich Point High School between Hightower and uh, Rich Point. I, of course, we are voting on this item. I'm I just like to get a get an idea. What is the rebalancing we are talking about? Any any specifics on it? Well, there's no. We have not developed a plan for that yet. But as you know, too, the any recommendations approved by the board would be actionable at a later time. We would put a timeline in place to do that rebalancing, okay. and so that we would we would convene the community to to begin that work. It could and would likely include potential boundaries. Um, for the new high school at the same time, theoretical boundaries, so that we could begin to implement some of those boundary changes. But we definitely expect it would, it would include include Hightower, Ridgepoint, and potentially even other schools. And I have a follow-up question to that because um, once we have a high school built maybe six years from now, um, is this rezoning or rebalancing is going to be again redone or you go back or what, what is the status? Well, the intent based on the board's, you know, ongoing desire to minimize impact movement on students, 
the intent would be to do it one time. Mm -hmm. That's why I had mentioned perhaps even addressing the, the potential zone for that new school so that once we do it, it's all done and we can begin to put it into effect even okay. before a new school would be constructed. Okay. Thank you. That is my question. Thank you, Mr. George. Mrs. Helliger. Yes, um, sorry. I'm glad you said that, the cut, because that um, made me start thinking something a little differently as I'm pondering this vote. Um, when we talked last time, I, I know I asked a question around um, looking at Elkins as well as um, Marshall. I think that's to me. Because we, we're looking at the five year or down the road, Elkins is going to be over capacity. And then we just talked about Marshall. This is, goes back to my earlier statement with your right, Mrs. Tassine. It's not necessarily the philosophy, but it's the implementation of it. Um, you know, how we look at different things. Now, I do understand that if we're going to do potentially, if we vote, we would do a rezoning of the height of the new school all at the same time and that will be done when we right now we don't have a specific timeline okay so then until we decided to let's say this passes if we decide to build a new high school what are we going to do to relieve rich point at this time because if you're not going to zone if you're not going to rezone to um, minimize the impact, then you're still going to have a problem. So I'm trying no. to understand how. So Ridge Point is is Beth, you're the correct me, but Ridge Point is under 120 percent um, for the next at least three school years. Right, Ridge Point will hit 123 percent in 2020 21. So we would need okay. to rebalance prior to that, but do the comprehensive rezoning to, to be able to designate when that would go into effect when the new high school comes online. So we could phase in incoming ninth graders into a rebalance um, situation and when the new boundary comes into play when the new high school opens in 24, 25 is when we're expecting that need. So it takes us how many years to build a new high school? Six? Oh no. No? How many years? Okay. <clears throat> no, the the actual construction is two years, but then you have another year of design uh, to go with it before you you can even uh, bid it out. So it's a total of three. Mm -hmm. Three years. Okay, I don't know where I got six from then. Okay, so right now as it stands, we're just rebalancing the room between Bridgepoint and High Tower. I think that's an for me that's an opportunity for us to include the Elkins and um, uh, Marshall at the minimum. Because when we looked at the numbers, because I, I asked a question about the utilization overall for the east side. And when you look at all the utilization for the east side, technically, based on the numbers, you often tell me if I'm wrong, it doesn't look like you need a new school. And so... <clears throat> That's why I was, I'm so challenged with this one, because we're asking really hard questions around how we make um, some of these schools um, successful. And then we're going to say we're going to build a new high school in that particular area. And I trust me, I understand the growth, but it's, it's still a challenge for me because we haven't totally defined all the programs yet to make sure that the schools like Marshall are totally successful and we're still just, you know, we're still looking at ideals. So it's not committed. So my problem is not necessarily do I think we don't need the high school eventually? Absolutely. Um, but it's a matter of the win for me at this point. It's the, it's the win. And especially if we're not going to do anything courageous like a rezone, it becomes extremely difficult for me because we're, we're doing this for this one, that for that one, and we're just not consistent. That's why it goes back to the implementation of the philo philosophy that I'm struggling with. Thanks. Thank you, Mrs. Helliger. Mrs. Tossan. Thank you, Mr. Burdine. Um, and thank you, Ms. Helliger, for those those thoughts because I've 
I struggled with this over the last week. Um, I, I talked to Dr. Dupree about it a couple of times, or at least once, about the philosophy. And if what we're doing for one area is consistent with what we're doing for another area. And I grappled with that quite a bit and um, will admit that I was able to reconcile this one because, and here's why. Um, first of all, the good news is we have six years. If we were doing a four-year bond cycle, I think I said that earlier, it, this would look very different for me. Um, but the fact that we're going out to six years when the data does show that we're going to need um, new high school space uh, and because we have time to watch and see what the growth is going to look like and where the growth is going to be and how our high schools are impacted, um, I think it gives us some time to watch and see how that goes. Um, and I believe, I mean, we voted to balance and rebalance enrollment and we say between Ridgepoint and Hightower, but I think that I agree that it needs to include, um, a, a good look at the high schools on the East side and, um, how to rebalance that enrollment. And we, we voted to do that. And I think that you're right that that's going to need to happen sooner and the new high school will have to happen later. Um, and so I do think that we're looking at rezoning. I think that's going to be a community engagement process as it always is. Um, all of Siena can't fit in a single high school. All of Siena probably can't fit in two high schools at this point, but so we're going to have to look at, at some, at some rezoning anyway. Um, I think the rezoning timeline does need to be looked at. I think we had talked about that happening next year, uh, starting that next year. I uh, know there was some discussion about that. That's correct. That is correct. Um, we'll definitely begin rezoning for elementary 51 in the fall. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about um, a preliminary timeline of beginning that engagement process in January of 2019, since it is such a significant and multi-phased approach. Yeah. It, it won't be, uh, it'll be a longer timeline of planning and engagement and then communicating that implementation for the future. Well, I think that that needs to happen because I think we need to start talking. It's, it's, it could be much bigger and we need to make sure that the entire, all of the communities impacted are brought to the table. Um, and I also think that, you know, we're talking about an, another middle school sort of in the air, that area and at least one, if not two elementary schools, I think. So I really believe that it's going to be a massive process when looking at all of that and it needs to start sooner rather than later. Because, you know, stability, we talk a lot about stability and my philosophy, I think I shared last week, is that, was that if we, I don't want to move kids unless we have to move kids. And then when we have to move kids, we want to keep cohorts together, but we also want to create certainty as much certainty as we can so that people, families know uh, or, or can plan for where their kids are going to go in the future. So I, I feel like that's important. That's, that's a philosophy as a board member I would like to adhere to. And I think it will be important for the district to start that process sooner rather than later in order to create that certainty. Um, and so to me, I guess to me, that's the consistency is that if I'm following in my mind, it, which is why I brought up the, um, the flexible scheduling to begin with is because it, number one, it was a program that we were already considering if it could help with utilization and help create some and help not move kids as much as possible. Then I felt like it was something we needed to look at, which is why I asked for the, um, the proof of concept for that to see if it could in fact help us. Um, so with that in mind, I think, you know, I think we're, we've done a pretty good job of being consistent and that we're trying to do what's best for students in each area, even though it may look a little bit different, um, for each area. Um, given that we have the extra time uh, to look at what's going to happen, 
I probably think that the high, it's a good idea to put the money in the bond for the high school right now. Thank you, Mrs. Tossin. Mrs. James. Mr. Rosenthal. Thank you, Mr. Rudy. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, Excuse I was going to talk. I put my sign down, otherwise I forget to put it down. All right. Thank you, Mr. Rudy. Um, and Mr. Rosenthal, he'll get right to you. Um, well, I'd like to just reiterate a couple of things that I've heard my colleagues say. One is I uh, believe also that the rezoning, rebalancing needs to happen right away or we need to start that process because I want to be sure we allow enough time to consider all the options and that the board has enough time to get educated and um, about all the data that's involved. It sounds as if it could maybe get a little bit get a little bit complicated. And I too am open-minded to hearing alternatives of this recommendation that may come or, you know, should we approve the one we have or or the one parts that we've already approved. I'm I'm open to hearing alternatives if we if that seems to bubble up as something that is um, that's valuable. I think that that I'd like to say two things. One is I don't want to spread ourselves too thin. If we try to do too many things, um, rezone a lot of kids, start an early college high school, start some other things, we're going to be doing trying to do too much at one time. And I'd rather make sure we do something really well and have it be effective and then move on to the next thing. And it could be because I'm a linear thinker. But... I don't want us to try to do too much at one time and overstretch ourselves. The second thing is, what happens if we decide, you know, we think about, we, we, we've kind of pondered where that new high school might be. What if we decide maybe we don't need it because we've got some successful programming going on somewhere else? Maybe we need it in a different form because we've changed our... Um, you know, I'd like to change the way we do business, the way we conduct education in a whole, in a little bit, kind of a more radical way. What you know, what happens if we change our mind? Uh, what would happen? Let's say we approve this tonight. What happens if we decide we later on you, you all look at it and decide we don't need it? What happens? Well, I think it would be a collective effort to decide it wouldn't be needed. We do our annual enrollment review, and that's something we bring to the board every year with recommendations about short-term and long-term needs. So I would say it's like any other part of our system. We would consider it every single year and then determine when it's the right time to or not to pull the trigger. I think, the to me, the upside to this item is that the money would then be available when the school is needed, whether it's four years, six years, 10 years or 15 years. Okay, and thank you. I, I, I kind of agree with that, and I think that's why I'm in favor of it also. I'm just mindful that operating a high school is a 5 or $6 million a year um, opportunity, and uh, that it's not, uh, we're, you know, we, we need to plan now for the, um, the obstacles of our future. And so I, I don't want to lose sight and just think, it's going to happen, and we're just going to somehow be able to increase our M and O because I'm not sure that that's really possible. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. James, Mr. Rosenthal. Thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, I agree. I mean, when it comes down to it, if if we believe what Pasa has told us and what we've seen going on there. Um, you know, I think they said 8,000 new homes still to come. I mean, you need another high school. And if you don't build it, then that growth isn't coming, and they all go to Katy, and then our tax base doesn't grow. And as far as the operations of the school, as long as it's, it's you know, fairly full, then it kind of pays for itself because you're putting those students, and, again, we get that money for, the, for each student. So um, I don't worry too much about that unless it's going to be half empty. And the way it's looking, you know, those are not in the projections. That could change. But we're not going out tomorrow to build it either. So uh, we do have some time. Um, 
One of the other things that I'm going to suggest, Dr. Dupree, is that uh, sooner rather than late, later, um, I, I think that um, based on what we've seen um, and some of the emails that we've gotten and some of the comments from Ms. Marino, um, I think some of our capacity numbers really need to be questioned. I, I don't. I don't fault Jacobs and I don't fault a consultant because the consultant had nothing to do with it. Um, Scott and, and uh, Tracy right they had nothing to do with, with capacity numbers. Um, that was uh, an approach taken by Jacobs in 2013 and I know I sat in that back room one morning with Jenny Bailey and we sat there with blueprints and they were showing us how they came up with that stuff. And um, uh, they supposedly walked everything and, and you know it was a it was a procedure. Um, could it have been, could the estimates of capacity be over, overly aggressive? Yes, it seems like it. Uh, as Ms. Marino sent us an email today, we've got Travis listed at 91%, but we've got seven T buildings and they looked like, I looked at it on Google Maps and they look pretty, pretty spanking new. Um, so something's going on. We need to understand that. And the same at Ridgepoint. Everybody I talked to, I met a couple kids up in College Station. They were helping us move my daughter out of her apartment. And we just started talking. And they said, oh, we graduated from Ridgepoint. So I said, oh, what do you think? They said, man, it's really crowded. You know, so everybody keeps saying this. You know, you hear it everywhere. Um, so something's happening. I, I don't think our capacities are, are, are really as large as we state. <clears throat> or we wouldn't be hearing this over and over again. So um, I really think we need to take a, a look at Ridgepoint and Hightower uh, and every place else that we're looking to make some of these these moves because uh, I don't I just I'm real concerned and I think we do need to to audit those. Um, but that being said, I think that this um, I think we need to approve this because this could be our last chance to do it, and I don't want to. I don't want to end up not doing it, and then in a few years, we're stuck because there's really no way out. So um, I say we need to do it. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. There's several great points brought up in this conversation. Um, I really like what you said about we need to study our utilization. I think that's definitely something that we need to make a priority. Um, the rezoning and the rebalancing does need to happen as soon as we possibly can can do that. And uh, Mrs. Tossan brought up something earlier about the difference between this and um, maybe some things in the past is this is six year planning period. Once again, this is not a four year planning period. So that does make a big difference, but I feel it will be needed. And uh, I think this will be a good investment in our community. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Next item, 12B4D. Consider reconsideration of the May 14th, 2018 board action to build a 12 classroom addition at Port Settlement Middle School. We have a motion. Yes, um, President Bourdain, I would like to resend the vote from our May 14 meeting and re, um, I move that we resend the vote from our May 14 meeting to build additions to Fort Settlement Middle School. Second. Motion made by Mrs. Helliger, second, second made by Mrs. James. Do we have discussion? Mr. George. Thank you, Mr. Verdin. Um, I agree with a um, um, couple of my colleagues mentioned about the, the capacity, and we need to study about it. And actually, um, this actually put, in my case, I can talk about it, put me in a very difficult situation where um, we started with 1399, and, uh, and uh, currently, Fort Settlement have 1427 students. We should, there is no trailers there. So we should have at least thought about where these kids are sitting. And uh, um, and I think 
uh, you know that is a failure from our side and as far as I'm concerned if that in information was available this whole item is there is no reason to discuss I tell you why uh, because um, based on that new numbers um, uh, Fort Settlement Middle School capacity uh, is what is that something around 90 something percent what is that 90 percent the utilization for 1819 in the new with the updated correct number is 77 percent at first colony which did not change and 94 percent at Fort Settlement 94 and and uh, by 2028 it is showing 116 percent that is correct. That is very well within our policy between 80 and 120, correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. Okay. And and also, I wanted to say, absolutely, we need to modernize um, Pascal Middle School. And that is not the oldest building in our uh, school uh, uh, system, but they have the highest FCI. Uh, that means it has been ignored in my opinion and that need to be modernized and then last meeting it has been mentioned we are uh, going to be putting around 22 million dollars aside to do that irrespective of what happened <clears throat> that is correct that's what was projected at this point okay and so to me we are not and and, and also by 2028 uh, first colony is going to stay about 80 percent is that correct yes sir 82 percent 82 percent so we are not really discussing schools within um, uh, 80 to 120 range if we had this number available before obviously there is no need to discuss this item because there is no rezoning and that's what actually in my opinion uh, most of these people coming from Riverstone area is saying they don't want to be rezoned and um, and we did like one of the speaker mentioned before we are um, spending or or decide to do based on the uh, projection today or the information presented to us 178 million dollars put aside for a high school um, and also rebuild um, Lakeview Elementary and also Meadows Elementary which all uh, based on the community's need I supported I still continue to support and so I believe first of all um, we need to make sure these numbers are right and second in my opinion I will be supportive of uh, rescinding this provided um, um, we are going to um, leave it alone and there is no reason to do anything in that field of pattern at the moment there is no need to do anything because it's all within our policy and that's what I have to say thank you thank you mr. George mr. Rice <clears throat> Dr. Dupree, I would like to know what the administration's recommendation is. Well, at this point, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a recommendation regarding the recension, but I do believe we did not provide accurate information that allowed the board to make the best decision. So with that in mind, I think the board's um, motion at this point is, is well worth consideration. Okay, but in light of the new information that we just got late this afternoon, what are we going to rescind this and then that's the end of it? Or are you going to look at it again or, or what are we doing? Well, based on the information we have, both schools are within policy, including Fort Settlement for the next 10 years, and that's the planning cycle we're currently acting on. So I'm not certain that any addition would be needed at either school at this point. Well, but I really want to know what the administration's, in light of the new numbers, what is the administration's recommendation? Because that's your job. Mm -hmm. You need to give us a recommendation based on accurate data, and then we can decide how to vote. So if we take this off tonight, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Are you telling me that we're not going to revisit it again or any? Or what are, what are we saying? Well, my recommendation on, the, on a second vote would be that we I do not feel it's necessary to do an addition to either school at this time. Okay, what about rezoning? All right, Beth. 
We do fall slightly below 80%, so that would fall not in a need to rezone at this time. I wouldn't recommend that need, but I would recommend that it continues to be part of that yearly enrollment review process. And if it were to dip significantly below at First Colony, below that 80%, or rise above at Fort, at Fort Settlement, above the 120 or start to approach that at a, in a uh, quicker way than what we have in the projections that we're currently looking at, then at that point I would recommend rezoning. But for the 18-19 school year, all the way into the 2022-23 school year, we're within that 80 to 108 um, percent at the most in 2022-23. Okay, well that, that's fine, but that's really not a recommendation. That's just, okay. that's just talk. Well, so my, if my recommendation would be no addition at either campus and that the current boundaries remain in place unless otherwise indicated through the annual enrollment review process in the future. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Mrs. Helliger. I'm just going to leave it alone. I, I think we, well, I lie. Um, I think that um, <clears throat> As, as was presented just now, we've got, we had bad data. I think we tossed around some ideas of whether or not we should rezone at this time. I mean, we just um, with with some other elementary schools, and I think that's what maybe Jim may have been really getting at was, you know, how do we um, stay within our? <clears throat> should we balance it now, or should we wait till when? So if we're going through a rezoning process and we want to make sure that we um, do a permanent fix to schools? Um, do we really want to wait two, three or four more years to do that? Or do we just go ahead and fix it now? Because we've had some other um, changes when it comes to um, Ann Sullivan that we didn't, um, we took kids out of one school and we didn't rezone those kids at that same time. So now those kids are going to have to eventually um, you know, be rezoned for some of the elementary schools because those capacities are going down. I just think we need to, when we rezone, we look at everything, make one good fix. And so three years down the line, people look back and say that this board, you know, we put some, some stitches and we made it work for our district and just get it done. Thank you, Mrs. Helliger. Please hold your applause. Mr. Rosenthal. Okay. So, um, I just got through stating that I believe our capacities are overstated. So that tells me that 116% probably already is approaching 120%. And when you have a chance to rezone or rebalance from 116 to 78 or 80, why would you not do it when they're in the same area and the schools are equally as good? Okay, I don't, I don't you know. Again, please hold your applause. My kids went to First Colony. Your kids went to First Colony. Your kids went to First Colony. Miss James's kid went, went to went to First Colony. You know, I really don't want to hear that it's a it's it's not a not a good school. It's not it's not true. And you know, 116 percent. Those kids are packed in. You got the same issue. Somebody brought up earlier, I don't remember, I think I thought I wrote her name down, but I have so many notes here. You know, what about the kids that want to get on a sports team? Okay, there's so much competition in the orchestra, in the band. There's too much competition. There's too many kids there. I'm sorry. That's not right. I taught eighth grade. Okay, so I taught in the middle school. Yeah, I only did it one year. But when... <laughs> my choice. But when... When you have all those kids in there, you're going to have big class sizes. And everybody always says, oh, the class sizes are too big. We need smaller class sizes. Well, then why would you want to pack 116% worth of kids into a school when you don't have to? You really don't have to. And here's the other thing. We know we've been looking for this land. Okay? It doesn't exist. Okay? It does not exist. So guess what's going to happen? That means we're going to have to add on to Austin Parkway Elementary and we're going to have to add on the Settlers Way Elementary. Both those schools feed First Colony Middle School 100%. So if you really want to be true to feeder patterns, then let's do that. That means you know whatever, if, if there's some section of Riverstone that's going to go to Austin Parkway, you know your kid's going to First Colony and then back to Elkins. 
it's 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 a perfect feeder pattern. The same thing with Fort Set with uh, Settler's Way. It goes to it goes to First Colony. Now they split up there, but so does please. Hey, excuse me. Fort Settlement splits between First Co Fort Settlement between Clements and Elkins, just like just like First Colony does. So they have almost the same splits. Okay, so. Let's be consistent. We heard the term consistent, so let's do that. Let's, we started talking about these feeder patterns four years ago. And again, it was that same morning that I was sitting in that back room and Tracy Richter started to introduce the concept to me. It's like, wow, this is a really good idea. And it is a good idea because these kids will stick together all the way through. Um, it also follows the steering committee's recommendation. I think overwhelmingly, they said rebalance enrollment. Um, it costs us nothing to do that. Okay. And the kids, the kids, to me, they have a better shot at a better education. Because so really what comes down to this, if you can avoid 116%, why not do it again? It's not like they're going across highways or byways or the other side of town. It's right there. I mean, let's be real. Okay. Nobody should be those those guidelines were set up when we don't have choices. Okay, we, we kind of settled on 120 percent. Okay, but we have choices now. We have a middle school that's about to get 22 plus million dollars in renovations. And I think we should make it. I, I personally, I, I think like you were saying, put some innovative things in there. And um, it's sitting there at 80 percent. That's a waste. Because there's, that's when you're wasting m and money. So we don't want to do that. So I say, um, I think we're still on the motion to rescind, right? So Try. to follow up on, on Jim's question, what do we do next? Personally, I say rebalance enrollment. That should be the next thing that comes. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Mr. George. I'm sorry, Mrs. Tossan. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Bourdain. Um the first question I'm going to ask Beth: When do you when do your numbers show greater than or that we hit 120 percent at Fort Settlement Middle School? They what? do not show that we hit 116 percent in 2027 28. And please, please Excuse don't speak me. out. Please don't speak out. Let us do our work, please. When do we show? For, uh, first colony hitting below 80%. They're projected in 1819 at 77%, which is next school year, of course. And then there's an uptick to 84% and not dropping below 80% until 2023-24, where they hit 79%. When does Fort Settlement Middle School hit above 100%? In 2020 21, they hit 102. The following year, 105. 108, 110, 111, 112, and so on and so forth to 116. Okay, and that assumes that our capacity numbers are, are correct, are yes, accurate. Okay, so um, here's what I think. Uh, I agree that we need to check the capacity numbers and make sure that we are accurate, um, not only at the high school level, but particularly in schools like Fort Settlement, they're going to be taken on above 100% capacity. I um, agree that we should rescind what we did uh, in May because we have new information, uh, information as recently as 3 o'clock this afternoon. So I think that, that we need to rescind what we voted on in May. Um, I think I said last week that my rationale for voting the way I did in May was that if possible, I want to keep kids, I want stability for kids. Um, and I don't want to have to rezone if we don't have to rezone. So keeping that in mind and for consistency, uh, I, I think that we shouldn't rezone until we have to rezone. But I believe that we should be exploring it as we explore uh the, the rezoning effort in that entire area. I think we need to look at when that needs to happen. And I think we need to give some certainty to any kids that potentially need to be rezoned. 
we're talking about, the other thing I said is I, I believe we need to keep cohorts together. I think if we have kids who are, um, who are already in middle school or in sixth grade, they need to be able to continue to go through. Um, I think that that's really important. I don't think that it's possible or even reasonable to um, just because one sibling went through that another one has to go through in the future. I have kids right now. Uh, I have one in middle school right now who, if she gets rezoned to another high school, she gets rezoned to another high school. She doesn't have to go to the same high school that her sisters went to. Uh, that happens. This is public school. We're dealing with public dollars and we have to sometimes move boundaries as we encounter growth. So I think that it's something that needs to be explored and looked at, as Ms. Helliger said, as we're going through this process. But I, I don't think we should implement it until we get to the point where we have to implement it. Um, I do agree with Mr. Rosenthal that we don't 120%, we put that in policy because we needed to give some flexibility before we built new schools. It wasn't necessarily if we had room at another school that we didn't you know, rebalance enrollment. It was, we put that in place, and I remember the discussion was so that we had some flexibility before we built new schools because we, saw we had to kind of get to that point before we spent capital dollars and had to build a new school. So I do think that it's something that needs to be looked at. We don't need additions. We don't need to put money in to expand core. If We shouldn't do it if we don't need to do it. Um, but I do think that we need to look towards the future of balancing enrollment. I also agree with Mr. Rosenthal that you know, we have two you're, we have two really good middle schools and the, our communities are fighting over two really good middle schools. And so we need to keep that in mind. Do we work to keep stability? Yes. Do we work to keep cohorts together? Yes, absolutely. But the part of Riverstone already goes to First Colony. And so we're, and, and First Colony is a top-notch middle school, and I just think that we need to keep that in mind um, as we go forward. So I agree and support rescinding, and um, I don't know if another motion will come up about rezoning, but I think we can discuss it at that point. Thank you, Mrs. Tossan. Mr. George. Excuse me, Mr. Burdeen, I haven't had a chance to speak on this item. I'm and I'd sorry, like I to call speak. I'd like to call for the question on the motion to rescind. Okay. Go ahead, Mrs. James. It means I'd like to ask I'd like to call for the question, so I'd like to ask us to vote now on the motion to rescind. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Mr. Bernini? Yes. <laughs> yeah, make a motion. Yeah. Do I have a motion? Yes. I hope I get this right. So I move that we rebalance enrollment with First Colony Middle School and First Settlement Middle School at the appropriate time. Second. Motion. Motion made by Mrs. Helliger or second by. Mr. Rosenthal, do we have discussion? Mrs. James. Yes, so um, I uh, believe that when we determine what elementary school, what our elementary school solution is in that area, whether that's additions on other elementary schools or whether that's a new standalone elementary school, it feels like that is the appropriate time to determine what uh, the middle school boundary should be. Because, and I think it's an appropriate time to look at it. That doesn't mean we need to make changes, but I do think we should look at it because I'd like to fix any feeder pattern splits we can or make the alignments. Um, what we can and I actually am in favor of balancing the schools I think it 
is less of a burden on staff. It's less of a burden on um, courses, and it and actually and provides opportunities for students. So I'm in favor of the motion as mentioned. Thank you, Mrs. James. Uh, Mr. Rosenthal. Thank you, sir. So I would also like to agree with uh, Ms. Tossin and Ms. James and Ms. Helliger. It, this doesn't mean that we're going to do this tomorrow because we do need to figure out, uh, one, we need to make sure we, we can expand Austin Parkway and, and, and do that work and at Settler's Way. Um, and uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that, again, grandfathering, you know, we're not going to be, you know, pulling kids out of Fort Settlement and sending them over to First Colony this year. Okay, we don't do that. But what it's looking at is the future, and that doesn't mean six, seven, eight years from now either. I'm not thinking that. I'm thinking in when, when, when the last of these kids who have possibly been affected by previous rezonings, and honestly, some of the emails are telling us how all these kids are getting rezoned, but uh, when Ann Sullivan, Ann Sullivan was built, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Ms. Ramirez, uh, Ms. Martinez, sorry. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a long night. Um, I always do that, too. Um, you just never hear it. Because <laughs> I figure it out before I actually say it. But um, <laughs> Anyway. Um, <laughs> when Ann Sullivan was opened, the, the students that were... Um, in Austin Parkway or in Settlers Way from Riverstone, it was kind of their choice to go to Ann Sullivan, correct? If they were rising fifth graders, they had the choice to stay at the current campus okay. or to move to Ann Sullivan. Okay, so the rest the rest were moved, had yes. had to go. Yes, sir. Okay, good. So that see that's another question that's really never been answered for me. So thank you for that. Um, and so those students, you know. We're not looking at it. That that would be ping ponging. We're not looking at doing that. Okay. Nobody up here wants to do that. So we are talking about, you know, in a couple of years, whenever that goes into effect, and I don't remember now. Um, but um, so, yeah, like I said, I've said everything I need to say. I'm, I'm for rebalancing. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Mr. George. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Berdin. Um, we talk about uh, certainty. We talk, talk about um, emotional well-being of our children, and uh, I believe that is one reason why I voted the way I voted last time, and um, I still stand by that. And also, uh, my situation here is there is nothing against uh, fourth settlement of First Colony. That is not the issue here. And if we are talking logic, we have so many places we are not uh, did uh, the logic rezoning in this process. So the question is, why when it comes to Riverstone or why, why we, when it comes to Port Settlement and First Colony, it is we have to do it logically. And, and so if that's the case, uh, Ms. Halliger earlier mentioned we have to have all across the board some kind of a standard where we should follow that. And also I want um, our audience to understand we live in a very thriving community and, uh, and you know, uh, communities are going to grow and, you know, rezoning is a process which we, uh, it's inevitable, it's going to happen. And so one thing I like to clarify, um, uh, the motion says appropriate time. And according to what I heard from um, Ms. Martinez, you said, um, by 2027, 20, 28, um, both schools are under the uh, policy limit. Is that correct? They're within the policy between correct, within and the policy. Yeah, within. I'm I'm sorry, within the policy limit. Within, yes, sir. Yeah. But prior to that, it first goes colony up and dips down. down. Yeah. Yes, and, okay, and so we don't have any projections projections after 10 years. It's only up to 10 years. That's correct. Okay, so. Yeah. It is a possibility we will get rezoned after that. But the, but the thing about it is what I like to have some kind of clarity here is what is appropriate time means. What is appropriate time? So what is the definition of appropriate time? Well, in my mind, I was thinking that, as Ms. Martinez um, stated earlier, that we review 
on a yearly basis based on some of the comments that we, we stated, stated earlier. But at that time, based on some of the other elementary schools and um, <clears throat> the additions and those kinds of things, we will take a look at it on a yearly basis until we decide as a board that it's the right time for us to make those moves based on the feedback that we received from the board. In, in my opinion, um, I understand exactly what Ms. Halagari is saying, but my opinion, that doesn't give any certainty for either community looking uh, here tonight. And so I like to have some kind of clarity when, when we are going to do Well, when I made the statement earlier around... Uh, I'm actually hold on, asking... Wait, 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 well, hold I'm, on I'm, one second. Yeah, sure. One at a time, please. Go ahead, Ms. Halagari. I know when I made the statement earlier... There was a lot of feedback. That's why I said based on the feedback from the board um, around going ahead and just get it done. And Ms. Tossan made some good comments. So as Mr. Uh, Rosenthal. Rosenthal. Around <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Ramirez. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's 11 o'clock, uh, past my bedtime. Um, so th that's why I made it the way that, you know, kind of a, a little blanket statement. So if someone can actually amend it, if they want to, to a spe specific time, if they would like. Okay, thank you very much. Mrs. Tossin, maybe a chance to speak. Well, so I, I, I hear what Mr. George is saying, and, and I, I, I am for certainty, but I struggle with giving a specific time because... As I agree with Mrs. James, that it's going to depend on whether we can build a, the new elementary school or whether we have to make additions onto the existing elementary schools. So, frankly, I don't think until we come to that decision that we can even undertake a timeline. So, maybe we proceed with the understanding that once that decision is made, that we will look at enrollment and capacities and then make that determination um, about about rezoning, which would be maybe not this coming year, but might would be the, the following year we should know by then. So that, I mean, I, but I, I hesitate to put it in a motion because it's it would be difficult for us to sit here tonight and know exactly when that's going to happen. Is that correct? I would agree. We'll receive the updated PASA projection or the updated demographers projections in, uh, for a report to the board in February. And so that's when we'll have our next annual enrollment review and we'll be able to review the current enrollment for the 18-19 school year with the projections and be a, a few months further down the road. So in we're terms looking of at more like the 1920, perhaps the 1920 that's school possible. year before we can. So that that gives some, some a, a general time frame without maybe boxing us into something specific. But I did want to respond to, you know, I think you said something about um, we're, you know, we, for other communities, we're not looking at rezoning or we're, you know, we're saying it's okay for this community and not okay for that. But I mean, so, but, but that's not true. That's not true because Sienna is being rezoned. I mean, everybody understands that, right? And see who in here in Sienna wants to be rezoned? OK, so it, it is consistent, guys. It is consistent because, I mean, really spent a lot of time looking at this the past, particularly the past week, but past several months. And, you know, my philosophy is the same. And we tried several different things in various communities to bring programming in and to try not to rezone and all these different things. And, and sometimes it just comes down to we have to rezone. Master plan communities are not neighborhoods. They're master plan communities. And so we cannot fit an entire master plan community in one middle school or one high school. It just doesn't work that way. And so we do everything in our power to keep the neighborhoods together. If you've come to any of our meetings in the past four or five years, that's what this board talks about. We do everything we can to keep neighborhoods together. We do everything we can to keep cohorts together and to grandfather and to minimize the impact as much as we possibly can. We really are child first and we do everything we can to do that. But there are times when kids just have to be rezoned and we don't uproot them from one middle school and move them to another middle school. We let you know in advance the rising 
kindergartners and first graders and second graders are probably going to have to go to a different middle school than the, the one you are currently zoned to. So we do everything we can to minimize that. So I really truly believe we have been consistent in this. And when we have to look at rezoning or rebalancing, then we do it for that for those neighborhoods. So I just wanted to address that. And I would like to call for the question. Please vote. Wait, wait. I, 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 I still want to clarify something because I'm not sure we have. There wasn't any objection last time when the question was called, but technically if you call for the question, it requires a second and it would require a majority vote to approve it. It also should not be used until at least everybody's had an opportunity to speak once. So provided so everybody, everyone has, which is why I, I called for it. So I will withdraw it for point of clarification by Mr. Rosenthal. Thank you. I just want to clarify. So by February, do we think we're going to have a pretty good idea of when additions might happen at the two aforementioned schools? And we should have the POSA numbers. So are we, are we saying that when we get that information, that is when we are going to look at the actual timeline? Okay. Does that right? Is, God, just because I heard I mean, Mr. George said something about 10 years from now, and, and I, I heard it. I don't know if that's what he was talking about, but I, I don't want somebody coming back next year and saying, wait a second, I heard 10 years. So I just want to make sure that for those of us who are in favor of this motion, that we absolutely understand that come, uh, uh, Mr. Perez, do you think? You could amend it, Mr. Rosenthal. No. Mrs. Hellier? I don't think it needs to be amended, in my personal opinion. I think um, it's going to be at the next time. So we do an evaluation every year or whenever the new policy number. So it's going to be part of our evaluation. I, I agree with you, Mr. Rosenthal. As long as we all understand it is that, not, yes. the, the amendment is not to look at it in 10 years. That is not the amendment. I mean, the, the motion, rather. Excuse me. Call for a vote. Okay. Second. Please vote. Vote passes. Please hold your applause. Thank you. Next, we're going back to our consent agenda. Do I have a motion? Mr. President, I move to approve the consent agenda in its entirety. I wanted to remove second. Okay. Excuse me, Mr. Rice. I, I made a mistake. I would like to take that back. You need um, to get the crowd under control. Okay. To ask them to Please be quiet. We're doing business here. Mr. Rice, would you withdraw your motion? Mr. President, I withdraw my motion. Thank you, Mr. I, Rice. I withdraw my second. So I, Mrs. Tossan. Mr. President, I would like to remove item from the consent agenda, item 11G1A. Um, All right. Mr. G. G1A. Mr. Rice, may I have a motion? I want to move. Okay. Excuse me. Mrs. Halliger? Um, from the consent agenda, A2. 11A2. 11A2. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Mr. President, I move to approve the consent agenda in its entirety, with the exception of removing 11A2 and 11G1A for further discussion. Second. A motion by Mr. Rice, a second by Mrs. James. Do we have discussion? Yes. Mr. Rosenthal. I would just like to, I brought this up last week, but we've actually amended it since then. 
Um, and since I kind of talked about it at our TASB presentation, I would like to bring up again our policy EIA local and uh, kind of what's in that and what's changed. Um, so um, one of the things that, that we put in there, uh, because we have this issue uh, sometimes with um, uh, teachers entering grades in their grade book and within minutes getting phone calls, emails, texts from parents wanting to argue with them about the grades. Um, <coughs> combined with we had our, um, our uh, recent graduate forum last December that I had attended and just about every one of those <coughs> students when we asked them you know how they felt about college and what you know what kind of skills they wish they had and almost all of them said that they wish they they were able to communicate better with their professors they didn't know how to do it they didn't know how to address their professors um, and so we also um, as part of that that presentation was about student ownership of learning so this policy this piece it um, it recommends that uh, teachers and, and students actually set up conferences to speak about their own grade. So if there's an issue with the grade, you get teachers and students talking rather than having a parent calling on their behalf. And it also uh, requests that principals uh, be involved and actually um, uh, support their teachers in this effort. So that, again, the goal is to have students kind of take ownership of their own learning and learn to communicate with their teachers rather than the parents do it for them. So that is now in policy if we approve it. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Mrs. Tossan. No, this is work, not me. Mrs. James. But Mr. Burdine, um, if I may make a point, this is your consent agenda. You really shouldn't be having deliberation on the consent agenda. Okay. If a board member wants to speak regarding another item, it'd be appropriate to remove it for consideration separately from the consent agenda. Well, Mr. Morris, we've had discussion on consent agenda in the past. Well, generally, you've, a, you've allowed board members to ask questions, which really is probably something as practice anyway, but I think what I'm hearing now is you're having the deliberation on a consent agenda. And the whole point of the consent agenda is to be able to pass the items without having discussion on those items. If you want to have discussion on an individual item, it'd be appropriate to pull it and discuss it separately. So help, help me navigate this forward. May I comment? I, I think Mr. Rosenthal was just explaining something that was in the policy. I don't think we're deliberating about it. I think he was just putting it, he was just mentioning some things because he presented on this at SLI in Fort Worth. So I think we're in the clear, but thank you for your advice. I would like to ask a question if I might continue uh, regarding, I don't know what number it is, but I believe it's uh, for the archaeologists um, for the James Reese Career and Technical Center. Do I understand correctly, Mr. Perez, that we are putting $743,000 for the archaeologists? Is that right? And is that in addition to some other funds we've already used or put aside? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. 147, and this is additional to for the uh, exhumation of the bodies. You might also mention how the board previously approved a million dollars, and so this is within the million that's already that the board approved a couple of months ago. This is just actually the contract by which that portion of that million would be spent. Okay, so that's fine. That's what I was trying to understand. It's part of the. Um, it's part of the million dollars. We've already approved the million dollars. This is just the contract around it. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. James. We're going to wait for Mr. Rice here. I can't find it. I have 
I'm going to print it out and I can't find it. Please vote. Motion passes. Next. Mr. Go ahead. Mr. President, I move to approve item 11A2 as presented. Mrs. Tossin. Second. Second. The motion by Mrs. Tossan is second by Mr. Rosenthal. Yeah. We have discussion. Yes, thank you. So I, just for those who are out there, BAA is the Board of Legal Status, Powers, and Duties. And um, when I was reviewing this particular policy, and the red line it was the red line was a PDF, so I really couldn't see what was actually changed. It was hard for me to navigate through. It was, there were so many changes, but so I had I printed it out somewhere. I don't know, I don't know what happened to it. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. <clears throat> so I guess I, I somewhat questioned to make sure I understood the the essence of what changed. Why we were changed making all these changes to this particular policy um, and there was some language in there I, I just wasn't totally can, um, clear why we added those things for example um, the board members are not representatives but are trustees who are entrusted with education of all students in the district this is more of a statement and which we are true we are trustees so I do agree that we are trustees but when I'm looking at other policies the policies is normally about action or shell or something like this so this to me I felt like was just a statement inside there and then when I looked at the management right the responsibility of the board as a whole those it looks like these things were actually already there and we just re um, we formatted and put some I mean, how much of this is actually new that was the hard part that I was trying to get to because some of you know, some of these things were, were already there. We just moved it from other locations. And that was where I, that's what I, um, I found out. So like, for example, in page one, it said management oversight is a responsibility of the board as a whole and not individual board members and exercising its oversight. The board shall not interfere with the superintendent's management of the district. That's normal language that we currently, I believe, have inside of, uh, um, current policy correct mrs james so i will attempt to speak to it and then we maybe others can add in or mrs mark if you want to ask mrs martinez something so um miss hogger i'm sorry that we didn't have a good red line version of the policy because the only red line version was in the long pdf of that um, it wasn't sep it wasn't separate. The one that you saw, you either had a choice of the highlighted one or the plain one, and not actually the red line. So I apologize for that. Um, the policy committee took on this policy because there, the, what the board was doing and what we were practicing in management oversight was significantly different from what this policy said. So I know it's hard to tell by looking at the highlighted version, but what we were actually doing was asking each year for the board president and the sit down and set out a schedule of 
major system reports that they would that they that he the superintendent would bring to us um, on a schedule, and at there were some that were supposed to be done annually, and there were some that were supposed to be done um, every other year. Well, we did that for a couple of years, and it was good, and we were and it was good because we were all learning about the organization, but we've now sort of shifted the way we do management oversight. And so Mr. Rosenthal and I restructured uh, the policy, which is why some of the things that are highlighted actually were in the policy before. They're just in a different location now. Um, the way we go about management oversight um, is, is different. Um, and we made some more general we made some more general um, statements uh, and talked about using uh, how we use the audit function and how we use the oversight of the district strategic plan and information reports and so forth to talk about how we currently actually do um, for uh, the major systems of the organization. And then um, I guess finally is we tried to align the language in the policy in terms of the philosophy and other uh, with language we used in other po in other policies so that we were because of this process is updating all of that so you're right some of the things were big barred and steel stolen some were reorganized and i'm sorry for the confusion and all the yellow um when when you recognize had already been in the policy. Thank you, Mrs. James. All right. Thank you, Mrs. James. I just wanted to clarify that because I know we specifically called out certain systems that we didn't um, call out the last time, as you stated, such as the climate survey and those kinds of things. Um, I just want to make sure that we weren't creating a new, I guess we did, but were we changing the essence of what our roles and responsibilities were? So I think I heard that we were not, and so I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Helliger. Right. Yeah, I, I think Mrs. Tossin. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at me. <laughs> I'll I'll pass to Mr. Rosenthal if you want to piggyback on that. No, I just yeah, that was a thank you for the explanation, Ms. James. And you you I was going to say something that you had just said at the end. So that that whole thing about climate surveys, you know, that's something that we added because we felt that that was not a tool we were using. In and we wanted to put that in there as, as an oversight tool. So so you, I'm glad you picked up on that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Tossan. Yeah, so I was just going to say that, um, I, that I appreciated the additions of, like, the communications and the community engagement because those are things that we were doing. Maybe we're not delineated. And so I think for clarification purposes, um, it was good. I, I like how you guys work to lay out the role of the board um, because it has kind of grown over the last, as we've learned, how we, what that we want that to look like. Yeah, to do it right. So I appreciate you guys doing that. So. Thank you, Mrs. Tossin. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Next up, Mr. review future board meeting agenda uh, items. Mr. Oh, I'm sorry. President, I move to approve item 11G1A as presented. So as, as corrected? As co corrected. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. James. Second. second. A motion by Mrs. Tossan and a second by Mr. Rice. So we have discussion. <laughs> yes. Mrs. So, Tossin. Thank you, Mr. Burdine. Um, I got ahead of myself. So the only reason I pulled this item is you have at your place uh, a very minor change that I made. To, I uh, suggested for the wording. Uh, it previously said partnerships shall relate directly to instruction. And I suggest change that to read shall relate to or support instruction because of our collaborative communities efforts. I just wanted to make sure that that was brought stated broadly enough to include those community partnerships that support instruction as well. That's all. Thank you, Mrs. Tossan. Please vote.
Next agenda item, future board meeting agenda items. Dr. Dupree. Yes, sir. So basically we have a meeting coming up July 23rd. Um, you can see everything looking out is pretty thin. And we do have policy EHBAF local that's going to be on that agenda. The information items for that agenda may get adjusted somewhat um, pending our additional work on the facilities master plan and capital planning. So I'll be working with the president to handle that. Any other questions or guidance at this point? No, sir. To adjourn? I move that we are adjourned. Me <laughs> Meeting is adjourned. <laughs> Thank you.